Ladies Prayer International is committed to the spiritual preservation of this generation and beyond and the spiritual restoration of previous generations. We are made up of women worldwide who meet on the first Monday of each month to pray focused prayer for the children of the local church community. We need committed women who will join together on the first Monday of each month and pray focused prayer for their children and the children of the local community and church. Connect to Ladies Prayer International on the internet, ladiesministries.com forward slash ladies dash prayer dash international. Locate us on Facebook and Twitter looking for Ladies Prayer International. In Georgia, it is our mission to get women praying. For future generations, we must bind together and touch the throne of God. Will you join us on this mission? Will you take on a burden to pray a covering for the children of your area? If you cannot meet in person, try setting up a monthly prayer call over the phone or through Zoom. We encourage you to meet on the first Monday of the month to bind with women across the globe. But if Monday does not work, use an alternate day. When you set up your monthly prayer meeting, or if you currently have one, please inform our Ladies Prayer International Georgia Coordinator, Sister Kathy Terry. If there is any information or help you need concerning Ladies Prayer International, please contact Sister Terry. You can locate her on Facebook, look for Kathy Terry, or contact her through email, kmterry at mindspring.com. That's km. T-E-R-R-Y at M-I-N-D-S-P-R-I-N-G dot com. ABLE Ministries is dedicated to assisting the special needs and disabled populations within the church and the community. It begins with open hearts, open minds, and love by pastors, ministers, and congregations. Visit ladiesministries.com forward slash able for advice from professionals and individuals in the field of special needs and disabilities, assistance with setting up monthly prayer meetings and support groups, and support for pastors, ministers, and churches. Get connected with ABLE Ministries on Facebook. There is a link on the ABLE page from the Ladies Ministries or search Facebook for ABLE Ministry. UPCI. Our Georgia director is Sister Jan Flader from Kingsland, Georgia. Contact her for support and information on dealing with special needs and disabled populations. If you currently have an ABLE prayer group or support group, please let her know. Facebook, search for Jan and Ed Flader and contact her by email, emerlyflader at gmail.com, E-M-E-R-L-Y-F-L-A- D-E-R at gmail.com. Sisters Ministry is sharing in spirit to encourage, renew, support women in the military and their families. Our mission is to provide encouragement for life situations, help to renew and strengthen commitment to God, and as a reminder that others offer support through prayer. Connect with sisters for encouraging articles and to sign up for their monthly newsletter at ladiesministries.com forward slash sisters dash two. Our Georgia Sisters Director is Sister Jan Flader from Kingsland, Georgia. If you have women in the military in your church or you have male or female soldiers who are deployed, please send their name and contact information and their family's name and contact information to Sister Flader. You may reach her through Facebook, look for Jan and Ed Flater, or contact her by email, emerlyflater at gmail.com. That is E-M-E-R-L-Y-F-L-A-D-E-R at gmail.com. Praise the Lord, Georgia District ladies. Sister Flater here, coming from Kingsland, Georgia, to talk to you about two groups that I represent for the Georgia District Ladies Ministries. The first one is Sisters Group. It stands for Strong in Spirit to Encourage, Renew, and Support. This is a group that is set up to support our military women whose husbands or family members have been deployed. 
I encourage you to please let me know and get the okay from that family member to have their name and number so that I can stay in co contact with them via email or text. If you can just let them know, give them my name and number. My number is 912-409-7848. I would like to encourage them, pray with them, be a prayer partner through their hard times. And also, if you need more information, you can go to upci.org. Sister Mary Loudermilk is the director of the Sisters Group. So we have a lot of information out there to help keep you encouraged with our military families during their time of family deployment. Also, the second group that I'm going to talk about is called the ABLE group. It stands for accepting, believing, loving, and embracing our special need children. And this is very dear and near to my heart. Some of you have special need family members. Maybe you have um, immediate family members. I have a 20-year-old autistic son that is nonverbal, uh, severely delayed. So I know I have the heartbeat for special needs. I know right where you're at. If you know somebody that needs encouragement, that needs help, maybe you're dealing with it in your church, don't really know what to do, um, please connect to me or go to the Facebook. There's an ABLE Ministry UPCI Facebook page. It has lots of resources, lots of examples on what to do for different things. Sunday School Resources, Sister Denise Wynn is the director of ABLE's ministry group. She is wonderful, and she has people under her that are great. So please connect with us. Let us know. We want to be there for you during this time, of, uh, that whatever you're facing, churches, pastors, pastors' wives, let us know. Let us help you. Let us provide you with some resources. We love you. Thank you for all that you do. God bless you, Georgia District ladies. The mission of HOPE is to provide encouragement, prayer, and resources for guidance through painful life transitions, separation, divorce, and the trauma of abuse for ministers' wives. The pain of our past does not define or determine our future. Connect to HOPE Ministries through the internet, ladiesministries.com forward slash hope. Also connect through Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, looking for Hope Ministries UPCI. If you are a local Georgia minister's wife and you need help, please reach out to Sister Sue Jury. You can contact her through Facebook, look for Sue Martin's Jury, or through email, suejury50 at gmail.com. That is S-U-E-J-U-R-Y-5-0 at gmail.com. Hi, I'm Sue Jury, the HOPE coordinator for our Georgia Ladies Ministries. The focus of our HOPE ministry is to provide a network of support and resources to our ministers' wives who are going through the trauma and painful life transitions of divorce. Some are even going through the transition of the trauma of abuse. These precious ladies need to believe that the pain of the past does not have to determine their future. It is our desire to stand hand in hand with them in reassurance that our God truly is a very present help in trouble and always knowing that weeping may endure for a night, but joy does come in the morning. God is faithful in all seasons of life, including the grief of divorce. Reinforced by our steadfast love, our prayers, our friendship, we believe the Lord will be their comfort and give each one of them a renewed purpose. Do you desire to bring others to a great knowledge of God and His plan of salvation? Do you desire to grow in your own walk with God? Then More to Life Bible Studies for Women is your place to belong. This series of studies is a proven, effective tool for reaching friends, family, co-workers, and others with a great understanding of God's plan of salvation. Strong Christians are developed by strong teaching. Visit our website to find devotionals, articles, free downloadables, resources, and to subscribe to the More to Life newsletter. 
Connect to More to Life on the internet at moretolifetoday.com or through Facebook, search for More to Life dash through God's Word. Our Georgia coordinator is Sister Tina Kamlick from Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia. Reach out to her for any Bible study needs. You can reach her through Facebook under Luke and Tina Kamlick or through email at tinakamlick at gmail.com. That is T-I-N-A-C-A-M-L-I-C at gmail.com. Hello, Georgia District Ladies of the United Pentecostal Church. We are so glad that you are a part of our great fellowship of women who are moving forward even in these unique times we are living in. I am Tina Kamlick, the Georgia District Ladies Bible Study Coordinator. Today, it is imperative that we reach our world, and we can do it one soul at a time. Home Bible studies or online home Bible studies work. Someone came to my home many years ago and taught me a home Bible study, and I will forever be grateful. Hand in hand with the teaching of the local church, the Word of God was planted in my life. Acts 5 verse 42 tells us the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing that they had been counted worthy of the suffering disgrace of the name. Verse 42 says every day in the temple courts and from house to house they did not stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus was the Christ. Georgia District Ladies God has filled us with the same Holy Ghost as the disciples, and we're privileged to have this precious Word of God to teach and to proclaim from house to house in the day we live in. Acts also tells us, ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be a witness unto me in the uttermost parts of the earth. The power you receive when you were filled with the precious Holy Ghost, was a power to make you a witness. You have the power and you have the tools. The United Pentecostal Church has placed so many simply formatted Bible studies at your fingertips. Tips. So simple that if you can read, you can teach a Bible study. We all know the scripture that's so beautiful that states, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Verse 12 says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. However, this scripture goes on to say in 13, Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners will be converted. Georgia District Ladies, God is calling us to renew our joy and to teach transgressors His way, to reach a lost and dying world in, with His Word. Home Bible studies work. Here in my hands are a few Bible studies you have available through the Pentecostal Publishing House. These are simple Bible studies that would change a life forever. Let's step out and teach someone. We are teaching Bible studies here in our local church through Zoom and in our homes and in our church building. God has changed your life and has changed mine. Let's be women who give back and teach His Word and change our world with the Gospel. If I can assist you in any way, please reach out to me by private Facebook Messenger, or you can reach me at tinacamlick at gmail.com. I want this year for to see hundreds of you ladies standing behind this sign next year at our ladies' conference behind this picture frame in 2021 that says, I teach Bible studies. I love you, Georgia District ladies. Let's change our world 
with his word. Lord bless you. Today's Christian Girl is a ministry for girls ages 10 to 18 years old. This program encourages individual churches to form clubs and hold monthly meetings for the purpose of teaching and training our young girls. Our motto is live in right and love in life. When our girls are taught to live according to the precepts of the Word of God and to live right, then they discover that they love life. Our mission is growing and strengthening our girls in the ways of God by means of dealing with the issues and challenges they face today and equipping them to make godly decisions. This is accomplished through club meetings that are fun yet spiritual. Connect with Today's Christian Girl by visiting their website at todayschristiangirl.com or through Facebook and Instagram at Today's Christian Girl and also on Twitter at TCGUPC. Our Georgia coordinator is Sister Allison K. Batten from Columbus, Georgia. You can connect with her on Facebook under Allison K. Poole Batten or through email allisonbatten77 at aol.com. That is A-L-I-S-O-N-B-A-T-T-E-N-7-7 at A-O-L dot com. Reflections is a bi-monthly publication to biblically encourage, equip, and empower women for the apostolic life and service. Beautifully put together and presented, we encourage you to not only read the publication, but then put it in your purse and leave it at a doctor's office or give it to someone in the store who looks like they need some encouragement. Articles range in topics from spiritual growth to family dynamics, personal growth, health, and more. Your life will be enriched by this fabulous publication. Individual subscriptions are priced at $14 for a one-year subscription or $24 for a two-year subscription. You may purchase this for yourself or as a gift. You may also subscribe with bundles. Bundles begin with five copies and can go as high as you would like. One issue in bundles, the price per copy is $1.75. Three issues in bundles, which is a half a year of Reflections magazine. The price per copy is $5.25. Six issues and bundles, which is one year of Reflections. The price per copy is $10.50. Connect with Reflections magazine on the internet, ladiesministries.com forward slash Reflections dash two. They are also located on Facebook and Instagram under Reflections Magazine UPCI. Mother's Memorial is the annual fundraising drive of the Ladies Ministries of the UPCI. Through this sacrificial offering, we support Tupelo Children's Mansion, New Beginnings, the Music Ministry of the UPCI, Lighthouse Ranch for Boys, My Hope Radio, Office of Education and Endorsement, Global Missions, North American Missions, Church Advancement, Urshan Graduate School of Theology, and World Network of Prayer. The very first Mother's Memorial offering in 1956 was $4,930.63. This year, you raised $3,163,300. God is truly working. Thank you to each and every lady who sacrificially gave and worked to raise money. In Georgia, reach out to your sectional representative for any information or needs you may have concerning Mother's Memorial. We have two reward programs in the state of Georgia to help us raise funds for Mother's Memorial. First is the Diamond Club. Personally give or raise $100 for yourself or in honor of a special lady or in memoriam of a special lady in your life. The next year you will be celebrated at ladies conferences. The perks are a reserved seating sign to leave where you would like to sit during the conference, a special bag and a special gift. Your name will be part of the diamond wall with a plaque you can take home at the end of the conference and you will be celebrated on social media. The final item is to be entered into a $100 Visa card giveaway. Second, you can be part of the Gold Circle of Givers. 
Personally give or raise $1,000 to Mother's Memorial. You will receive all the perks of the Diamond Club members, but you will also be invited to a special meal with the Georgia District Ladies Committee, where you will receive one-on-one -on -one time with the Ladies Leaders of Georgia. For both Diamond Club and Gold Circle of Givers, please make sure your pastor's wife or ladies leader sends your name in on the provided form with the offering. Forms are sent in the pastor's packet in January and are also found on our Georgia District Ladies Ministries UPCI Facebook group and the Georgia District website. Let's set a record of giving in 2021. You cannot outgive the Lord. Ladies of the Georgia District, we want to thank you so much for your Mother's Memorial offering this year. Due to this year's global pandemic and living in unprecedented times, we realized that it was a sacrifice on your part to give this year. I know that many of you had to cancel bake sales, garage sales, and all kinds of fundraisers, but you stepped up to the plate and said, we can do this. As we heard many times this year, God's got this. With that being said, I want to tell you that we were so thrilled about this year's offering. The total Georgia District Mother's Memorial offering for 2020 was $64,306. This offering was a little over $1,000 more than the 2019 Mother's Memorial offering. We only lacked a few churches that did not give, so we qualify for the 90% award in the UPCI Ladies Ministries. We can't say thank you enough for your hard work and dedication to Ladies Ministries. You have been instrumental in providing the means for the gospel to be carried once again to the far corners of the earth and all across our North American continent. May God bless you and reward your faithful endeavor to raise money for this great cause. On behalf of the Georgia District Ladies Committee, we want to recognize the top 10 givers in the Georgia District. In 10th place, Pastor Brandon Batten of River City Pentecostals, $1,200. In 9th place, we had a three-way tie. Pastor James King, United Pentecostal Church of Thomaston, $1,500. Pastor Curtis Vincent, Lighthouse United Pentecostal Church of Dublin, $1,500. Pastor Steve Waldron, New Life of Albany, $1,500. Number eight, Pastor Talmadge French, Apostolic Tabernacle, Jonesboro, $1,600. Number seven, Pastor Myron Wideman, DeKalb United Pentecostal Church, Stone Mountain, $2,000. Number six, Pastor David Hodge, First United Pentecostal Church of Savannah, $2,790. Number five, Pastor A.B. Stewart, First Pentecostal Church of Oakwood, $3,000. Number four, Pastor Harold Shepherd, The Church of Columbus, Georgia, $3,940. Number three, Pastor Alonzo Terry, Solid Rock Pentecostal Church, College Park, $4,600. Number two, Pastor Danny Webster, Pentecostals of Brunswick, $5,000. Our first place pastor is Daryl Johns from Atlanta West, Lithia Springs, $7,200. Georgia District, we love and appreciate your support. May God richly bless you. Thank you so much.
Ladies, welcome to our first virtual Georgia District Ladies Conference 2020. We are thrilled that you chose to be with us this morning. We regret that we all can't be together in person at the Georgia campground as we have done so many years before, worshiping together, singing together, praying together, and yes, laughing together. But wherever you are, in your home or at the church with your ladies, we encourage you to worship with us and be blessed. We look forward to hearing from our speakers today, Kathy Hernandez from Nevada and Vicki Oliver Vernon from Wisconsin. These ladies are amazing and anointed. You will be inspired and encouraged by their ministry. I want to say thank you to all who came together to make this happen. I love you beautiful ladies. Now enjoy Ladies Conference 2020. Worship him right now. I've seen my God in the midst of the fight. Turn down the heat and make the devil a liar. He's always with me. He's always working all things for my good. Say victory. Yeah. the Lord.
worship you. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. I wonder wherever you are, if you could just close your eyes and lift your hands right now. And think about how good God is. This has been a tough year. This has been a different year. But God is still good. God is still good.
so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Every voice lifted all my life. You just lift an anthem to him right now. All my life you have been so you never left so good. You never turned away. Every breath that I am made. So I will see. I will see of the goodness of God. Yes, I will. I will see. Of the goodness of God. Could you tell him how great he is right now? you are let's worship hallelujah thank you lord jesus for you are great lord hallelujah you are faithful like they sang it oh god i thank you lord praise god praise god if you're in isolation today or quarantine or if you're a student that has to do your schoolwork at home and you no longer are able to go into the school or maybe your workplace has sentenced you to hours of work in front of your computer at home and you're no longer commuting Think about all the extra hours you have at home with your families to worship him. It seems like the pandemic is a terrible thing, and, and it is. And there have been lives lost, and there has been pain. But God is still God, and he is controlling everything on this earth. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we need to put our attention on him and worship him in every situation we're in because he is doing something in the midst of this. He is moving on the earth. He is making people aware of him. And people are praying that never prayed before. And this is a great opportunity. So let's continue to worship you can have a Holy Ghost time right there in your home. You can be slain in the spirit. You can pray for each other and someone can be miraculously healed. I've already heard so many testimonies of all of those things happening. God, he's not restrained by many or few. Praise God. And we've seen in China the powerful move of God in a small apartment. And I've heard of things happening in Alaska and way up by the Bering Strait and in a home where people receive the revelation of Acts 2.38. There are things happening, even if you look at the book of Acts, Cornelius' home, how powerful that the Gentiles, the Holy Ghost was poured out in the home. Expect anything to happen where you are, watching these services, worshiping him. And let's give him glory in everything we do. In Jesus' name, worship with us as we give him glory with the song, How Great is Our God. In Jesus' name.
Just lift your hands wherever you are. message, a message that came from the anointing on a life through a saxophone. How powerful. If you didn't feel that, there's something wrong with you. We could just give an altar call right now. Thank you, Sister Hernandez. That was glorious. It's wonderful to be with the Georgia District ladies again. I love you. And I'm so glad that we're together, even though we're not really together. I'm with a few of you here. What powerful, wonderful worship and music, always. Thank you, ladies. It was so good. My friend, Sister Pam Hodge, thank you for calling me and letting me come back to Georgia. I said, I've already told them everything I know in Georgia. (laughs) She said, well, they just want to hear it again. (laughs) So if you have any complaints, let her know. But I'm back with you again, and I've sought the Lord for you. And I really believe that what I have for you tonight is timely, timely for the end time church. Thank you, Sister Sandy, for your hard work, this committee that puts this all together. We have a lovely room. There was a beautiful basket that was delivered, classy, full of great things. And thank you again. Georgia just knows how to do it. Thank you so much, District Superintendent, Brother John's. First Lady, Sister Johns, for this opportunity. Like I said, I love Georgia. I've spent a lot of time in the last 25 years in Georgia, and I love the Georgia District. I, um, for many, many years, matter of fact, this is 30 years of full-time ministry for me. I was at the 30th mark in April. You know you're very old when you've done something 30 years. It is also my 50th year to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost this year, my year of Jubilee. And so I'm celebrating big time. And when I started out all of those years ago, I started primarily in children's ministry, as most of you know, and had a lot of experiences with children. That's where I really got most of my humility because children (laughs) will let you know just how little you know. Uh, I was walking in a door of a church, and there was a little boy in the foyer, and he was swinging on the handrail, and um, about four years old, and just adorable, little blonde curls and baby blue eyes, and his eyes were so striking and so light blue that I made a comment. Now, I was going to go the route of making a friend and mentioning Jesus and that kind of thing, and, and I said, you have the most beautiful blue eyes I have ever seen. Where did you get those eyes? He said, they came with my head. And uh, he looked at me as if I were the dumbest woman he had ever met that didn't know that your eyes just came right along with your head. Another little girl, when I was fluttering around, I had over a hundred children in a children's crusade. The adults were having their meeting over in the sanctuary, and I had over a hundred children by myself I was running around the room and trying to get them seated and quiet ages 5 through 12 and a little girl grabbed my skirt tail and stopped me I was coming up the aisle hurrying to the front she said lady hey lady and she was about four years old all dressed up and hair and curls and a big bow and a beautiful little girl and she batted her eyes at me she said I just want to tell you I'm gonna give you like 10 minutes If it doesn't get better than this in here, I'm going to my mama. (laughs) So if it doesn't get any better than this in here tonight, you just have to turn it off. (laughs) 
but I think it's going to get better because we're going to turn to the word of the Lord. Will you turn to Psalm 42? We're going to read verses 5 through 11 and then skip down to Psalm 43 just below. I don't really read a lot of portions of scripture. I usually take a text from a scripture or two. But the Lord has really directed me to this psalm, and we're going to read verses 5 through 11 in Psalm 42. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and of the Hermonites and from the hill Mizar. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. And in the night his song shall be with me and my prayer unto the God of my life. I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me, while they say daily unto me, where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet Praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. Looking down to 43 and verses 4 and 5, it will seem repetitive because it is. Then will I go unto the altar of God, unto God my exceeding joy. Yea, upon the harp will I praise thee, O God, my God. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God. For I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. I'd like to speak to you tonight for just a little while on this topic. Quarrel with your soul. Quarrel with your soul. David was having... A quarrel right there for us to read with his soul. A quarrel, when we talk about a quarrel, we would identify that, define that as maybe an argument. I had a quarrel with him, a quarrel with her. I had a fight, an argument, a spat. We would just define it as simply that. But in looking a little deeper, I found something interesting. A quarrel is a heated argument or disagreement, typically about a trivial issue between people who are usually on good terms. That's the difference. An argument, maybe a spat, might be, be between people that argue all the time. They can never see eye to eye. But a quarrel is set apart by the fact that it's two people that usually get along. And all of a sudden, they find themselves quarreling. A quarrel with your soul, a quarrel with yourself doesn't happen very often because most of us think we're right all the time. And so we get along real good with ourselves. It's other people we don't get along with. I think it's cute that when a married couple has a quarrel or a little spat, it's really important that we make up and we call it maybe an intense moment of fellowship and not actually an argument because everything's going to be all right. A quarrel with your soul is simply talking to yourself or your soul about reality, what's really happening, and encouraging yourself in the Lord. I'm really good about telling stories, the things that happen to me, okay? Most of you have heard me minister multiple times, and that's what I do and what I'm known for. It's how God uses me. I've been through a lot of things in my lifetime, and so God has turned those around in analogy and parable, and I tell those stories. It is not very often that I actually recite stories 
from the word, even though I love them and know them, because I'm nervous about reciting somebody else's story, especially somebody like David. David makes me a nervous wreck. David was always in some kind of mess. And yet, there was no one who loved God any more than David. David had learned through his battles in life, through his failures, Saul chasing him, some things that we all must learn. And I think it is good to look back to the life of David, to a specific story tonight in 1 Samuel. It's where that famous scripture is that we quote so often that David encouraged himself in the Lord. We find him here in the Psalms, disquieted, arguing with himself. And so we look at this story and understand that here's yet another scrape he's in, another time that things are not going very well. David is running from Saul, and he has an army of 600 men, and they're going to join the Philistine army. So they leave their wives and their children and all of their things they have and set up there. They've set up home, and they leave. All of the men folk leave, 600 of them. While they were gone... The Amalekites came in and attacked. They took all of their wives and children captive. They stole all their stuff. They set everything on fire. And now there is really nothing left. It's all burning, and David's plan does not work out. Should you ever have a plan that you had all set up, and you thought that was the job you should have, and you thought that's where you should live, and you thought it was going to be this way, and nothing seemed to work out. David found that the Philistine army did not accept him and his men and he had to turn around and go back home. I'm sure he was wondering, well, why is this not working out? I thought this is what I was supposed to do. But it turned out that if he had joined them, he wouldn't have gotten back in time to see that he had lost his wives, the wives and children of his men, and all of his goods, all of his cattle. Everything was gone, and his village was on fire. David got back in time to see all of that. And the Bible said he and his men were so beside themselves that they wept until they couldn't weep anymore. I don't know about you. I'm sure there have been things in life that you cried until there just were no more tears. Until you were so distraught and beside yourself. I know particular times in my life that I was so beside myself. I curled up in a fetal position and cried for days. David found himself completely depleted without hope. What am I going to do next? It is those times where it is so important to remember scripture. And remember what, where our hope is. Remember what David did. The Bible doesn't say things started looking better and then David was encouraged in the Lord. The Bible doesn't say that he got an answer from God and then he felt encouraged in the Lord. The Bible says he got up from the floor. That's step number one. You just get back up. You put one foot in front of the other and you say, you know what? I know who I serve and I'm just going to encourage myself in the Lord. It won't always be this way. Didn't mean everything had changed. Nothing looked any better at that point. Somebody out there needs to hear me. Get up. Get up. He encouraged himself in the Lord. And it was a very hard time because people that were supposed to be his friends, the Bible says some of those guys started murmuring. And he heard the rumors. He heard the talk. And they were saying, let's just stone David. Let's just get rid of him. Let's, let's stone him. That's the last thing you need when you're going through the battle is for your friends, for the people around you, people that know you, to murmur. Let's not be murmurers. Let's not talk about other people. You don't know what anybody's going through. You don't know their story. It's not your story. It's their story. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. 
And then the very next thing he did, which is so important, he went to the priest and he got the ephod and he began to pray. He said, I'm not getting up here from here until I get an answer. I want to know what to do. A lot of people just do what they think they should do. Consult your pastor. He went to the priest. You need to be under authority of someone who can speak into your life. Your pastor, his wife, those in authority over you. I have many people that speak into my life that I won't do anything without talking to them because I trust them. David stayed until he got an answer and the Lord said, you're going to recover all. Go on into battle, head out because you're going to recover it all. I'm talking to somebody tonight. You got to get up because the Lord's saying you're going to recover it all. You're not, it's not always going to be this way. David took his men and 600 of them, they made it to the valley of Besor. And 200 of those men said, we are so weak and we are so tired. We cannot go any further, David. He said, well, you just stay right here with the supplies. It's okay. The rest of us that are a little stronger will go on. That's no problem. That tells me we need to hold up each other. When I am weak, you can be strong for me. When you're weak, I'll be strong for you. I'll battle for you. I'll get on my knees and I'll battle. I'll intercede for you. When I was going through these hard times in life, there were people who picked up the phone and said, the Lord laid you on my heart. I've been in travail for you. When you're in the valley, then I can battle for you. They went in and started on their journey and all of a sudden you know they're just going back to get their stuff their their wives their kids and all their 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 yard tools and their tupperware all the stuff <laughs> they got to find out where this army went where are the amalekites we don't you know they just headed out but with a promise that they're going to recover it all and so they they head out and all of a sudden one of the the men found this guy he's, he's laying looks like he's dead or half dead and they come bringing him to David David we, we found this guy he's non-responsive David said well get him some water give him some water to drink and try to wake him up give him some food you know David's trying to recover what he's lost he doesn't have time for this he could have just very easily said, well, we don't have anything to do with him. He's dead. Just, you know, bury him. Put him over. You know, we don't have time for this. But David took time out in the middle of his problem and his dilemma to minister to somebody else. He's, and he didn't just give him bread and water. When the guy started getting revived, David said, now bring him some raisins because, you know, that's got sugar in it. That'll pep him up. And then when he ate the raisins, he said, well, go get him some fig cake. He gave him dessert. The guy finally came too. He'd been laying there for three days and three nights without water because he was a servant to the Amalekites, a servant to the enemy. Wow. We just, we just fed him our cake. And he was one that came in and, and, and destroyed our stuff and, and, and kidnapped our, our wives and children. And we just fed him cake. And did David at that point say, put him to death? No, David had a conversation with him. Because there's always a point where you might be able to win somebody that is on the enemy's side. So you don't ever just walk on by. Even though you're in the middle of trouble and your life's a mess, there might be somebody you can win along the way if you just take time out. Man began to talk. He said, oh, I know where they are. I can, I can lead you to them. But you have to promise me that you won't turn me over to them and, and, and that you won't put me to death. And then I'll take you to them. David said, you got a deal. You know what? You want to join up with us? We'll let you join up with us. That's how we go out into the world looking around for those who want to just join right up with us. The enemy, we'll, we won't turn you back to the enemy. The young man showed them where they were, and when they went down into that valley, it was 
the sun was beginning to set. And what was happening, they were having one big party. They were eating and drinking and celebrating the spoils of David. Look what we got. And they had not killed any of the wives or children. Everything was still intact because all they were worrying about was celebrating their victory. And David and his army went in. The Bible said they battled all night, all day the next day. A lot of times we just tell that story and say they went in and recovered it all. No, the battle was still raging. Sometimes things last a little longer than we like for them to. Sometimes we got to just stay in the trenches and battle on our knees. But eventually we regain what the enemy has taken a hundredfold. And that's exactly what happened. David's wives came running. The wives and children of those men came running, embracing their daddies, their husbands. They recovered all the spoils of war, everything that they had taken. They got it all back intact. And not only that, David took all of the livestock that that opposing army had and took it back with him. We always come back with more. Your story's not over yet. When you're walking with God, you're going to end up with much more than you had in the beginning. The Lord never allows the enemy to take anything that you don't get back a hundredfold what the canker worm has stolen. Hallelujah. David came marching back. When they got back in that valley of Basor where they left those 200 men, they said, look here, we, we brought your wives and children. They had a family reunion going on. But you know what? There's the murmurs again. You don't want to be one of the murmurs. We call them Job's friends. Oh, yeah. The murmurs, well, you know, these, these guys didn't go with us to get back the yard tools and the Tupperware and the wives and kids. So they can have their wives and their kids, but they can't have anything else. They, they don't deserve it. No, we're all part of one big family. We're all part of a body, and every part of the body is just as important as another part of the body. David said, no, what will happen here, we will divide evenly because we all belong together. We're one big team here, one big family. And the Bible says that he put that into order, put that, that into writing. It was done that day, and it is done to this day. But it's divided evenly. Again, the murmurs didn't get their way. Murmurs just murmur and complain, and they're miserable human beings. But they never get their way. And they never really affect anybody with their murmuring. It can only affect you if you allow it. David never allowed it. So we find the, the end of this story is so wonderful because David took back all of the, the spoils of war. The Bible says he even sent gifts, some of the plunder, to the elders of Judah as a gift, taking care of the elders. No wonder David wrote in the Psalms that when things are going bad, I just have this quarrel with my soul. Oh soul, why art thou disquieted in me? Disquieted means just what it sounds like it means. Disquieted. No words. Have you ever been so broken? There were just no words. One phone call, one report from the doctor, one betrayal. I have where there were no words. How do you even respond? What do you even say to this disquieted? There are no words. That word disquieted actually translates out to be a moan. A moan. It, it is described by one of the commentaries that it is like a bear that has been treed. And very often when the bear is treed and maybe her cubs are somewhere over there on the ground and the enemy is nigh and she is up in the tree and she begins this process and a human will 
actually think that she's angry and she's growling and the, the human will think that she is ready to attack or pounce but that's not the case at all she will click her back molars and she will moan and the, the tears will run down her face a bear now she will weep and, and moan and that's what the commentary described as being disquieted We've been in a year where we have felt many times disquieted. What's going on? But it's already been said tonight and I must address it again. This did not catch Jesus by surprise. And the greatest day of the church is yet to come because we're seeing the backsliders come home. We are seeing people pray through. Yes, with masks on their face. The devil thought he would stop it. But we're going back into the enemy's camp and we're taking back what the devil took. We're going to recover cover it all friend our backslidden children are coming home hallelujah this is going to shake not only the world but the church and it is happening where we are waking up we're waking up we saw 26 filled with the baptism of the holy ghost this past weekend Jesus is doing, we've been to 36 churches this year. We've recorded 11 sessions, but we've physically been to 36 churches. The devil thought he was going to stop evangelism. He's not going to stop it. It may look different, but he's not going to stop anything. Have a quarrel with your soul. David said, wake up. Have a quarrel with your soul. Ask your soul, why are you disquieted within me? What did David say? Do you remember the Hittites, the Valley Mizor? Do you remember what happened there? You remember what God did here? He began in this text that I read to look back. He was reminding himself in this quarrel what the Lord has done. There comes a time where you have to pick yourself up and say, wait a minute. I need to look back and count my blessings and remember what God has already done in my life because he'll do it again. <laughs> Hallelujah. Every once in a while, I have to remind myself of what the Lord has done. My countenance changes when I begin to recall what he has done. I was on an airplane. I was deplaning. You know how it is when you're on an airplane. Everybody wants to be first. And most of those people don't, they don't remember what they learned in kindergarten. That we take turns. I was a kindergarten teacher for five years before I started into full-time ministry. So it takes everything I have not to say. Sit down, it's not your turn. Because here are these people that get in the aisle and they start running up the middle aisle. You're supposed to just be playing seat by row by row, seat by seat. Well, I got out into the aisle simply because I'm tired of sitting. I need to stand up. And I just stood in the aisle as solitary as I can. It's packed. It's usually hot. There are bodies everywhere. So I step out in the aisle. I have my purse on my arm. And the man in front of me is dressed in a very expensive suit. And I know what I, he looks like an attorney, but I found out that he is really a rock collector. Because he took the little suitcase out that belonged to him in the overhead, and he simply dropped it behind him on top of my foot. And he just pulled that handle up and began to march off into the sunset. I am bent over double with the people behind me going, go, go on, why am I moving? And I'm bent over and my foot is, is just killing me and I'm crying out, Jesus, I don't care who hears me. And he goes right on. He doesn't even know he hurt me. There's, that's another message. That's another whole mess. He has no idea he even hurt me. And so I'm limping out of out off the airplane, and I somehow get my baggage, and I get to the rental car place, and I get my rental car, and somehow I drive 
and get to the hotel because I have to be at church that night, I'm starting one of four weeks of junior youth camps for the summer. My foot is swollen. I can't get a shoe on. It's purple. I don't have time for this. I let the Lord know. I don't, I don't have time for this. I have four camps. I, I can't go home. I, I don't have time to be in the emergency room. And so I am praying very hard about this. And I just, you know, being sister matchy tacky that I am, I just go buy slippers in every color. <laughs> and I preach every night in slippers because you just do what you got to do. And so I am ministering in these camps and I am crying myself to sleep at night and I'm taking ibuprofen and I'm icing it and it's purple and it's swollen and throbbing and finally when I can't stand it anymore I go to the ER and they x-ray and he gives me my x-ray and he says you must see an orthopedic surgeon right away the bone on top of your foot is broken it's begun to heal and it's overlapping now a bit I don't know what they're going to need to do possibly a surgery re-break but you're going to have to see an orthopedic he gave me the x-ray so I preach three more weeks of camp and I I'm hobbling, and I'm telling the Lord all along, Lord, I don't have time for this. You're the healer, and so I need a healing. I, I, I need you to take care of this. I am in the fourth week on the last night of junior youth camp. Seventy-three had received the Holy Ghost that weekend in that camp. I am up ministering, and the Holy Ghost begins to fall on those children. They are lying all over the floor, speaking in tongues, the power of God all over them. Some are shouting and running the aisles. The last night of camp, they're giving birth to their ministries. God is just doing a work, and I'm standing in the pulpit, and I'm weeping and watching what God is doing. And I've been having a quarrel with my soul all week, reminding myself of all the times God healed. All the times he showed himself strong in my life. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, if you will run around this tabernacle, I will heal your foot. I'm like, that can't be God. Because I don't run. <laughs> I don't know how to run. <laughs> I mean, I don't run when my foot is doing fine. <laughs> I guess I could run if I had to, but I, I just don't usually run. So I ignore the voice. Sometimes the Lord will ask you to do things that are out of the ordinary. If I had ignored the voice, I wouldn't have gotten my healing. But the Lord said, run around the tabernacle and I will heal you. And I kicked off those slippers and I took off running. And the first couple steps hurt terribly. And all of a sudden, the pain lifted. I made one lap around that tabernacle. When I hit the platform, that foot was whole. There was no pain. God took it immediately. And I shouted and danced and people saw what God did. I got back to the room and the bruising was gone. The swelling was gone. I wore my shoes and I still went back to the orthopedic surgeon because I wanted him to see. He took an x-ray of the foot and he sent the, the nurse back in, take her back out and have her stand up this time. And while, you know, the, they did the second x-ray and he's got the one eye brought hanging up there. And finally I said, you know, let's save yourself some trouble and save me some money. Because I just need you to know the Lord healed my foot. He said, well, something happened because this x-ray you gave me does not look like your foot. He said, this foot has never been broken. If a foot is broken, there's going to be some kind uh, of a mark. You're going to see it on an x-ray. There's going to be a, a residue there. there there's going to be a mark. This foot has never broken been broken. I'm talking about a God who heals, a God of miracles. Every once in a while I have to go back and remind myself remember what God did back there. Remember how he healed you Vicki. He can do it again. Somebody needs to shake themselves and say, oh soul, why are thou disquieted within me? Remember what God did when I didn't have any money and the check came in the mail. Remember when my baby was sick in the middle of the night and I laid hands on her and she was healed. Remember all those times, Lord, that you touched 
touched me, that you healed, that you comforted me in my time of trial and sorrow. You've always been there. I'm showing you how to quarrel with your soul tonight, reminding yourself of what God has done. Don't get stuck on those times when he said no. I know people, bitter people, who won't have a quarrel with their soul. The only quarrel they have is, well, God, God didn't do it that time. God said no that time. You know what? We all have times we could go back. That's not how you have a quarrel with your soul. You don't go back to the times that he said no. Those times you say, you know what? I trust him that whatever he decided was for my good, it was for the best. And then you move on. The quarrel with your soul is looking back and remembering what he did do. All the battles you did win because he was with you. Don't get stuck on the times he said no. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. We don't always understand, but we trust. I was in Africa. We had gone out to an orphanage, and uh, we were to carry our own little side cooler of water with us. You couldn't drink the water, of course. Parasites and so on. We took our own snacks and water. We went to the orphanage to minister, and... My heart got bigger than my brain, and I gave away everything I had. I gave away all my water. I gave away all my snacks to the children. The day was moving on, and it was up in the high 90s, very hot, humid. There was no water. I realized, you know, I'd been playing ball with them. We'd had service with them. Jesus had filled many with the Holy Ghost. We'd had a baptismal service. It was a very long day, and I hadn't had any water. And really, I was so busy, I didn't think of it until I started having symptoms of being dehydrated. And I didn't tell anyone, but I, I, I knew I was in trouble, and I was so ashamed because I, I thought, that was just not smart, Vicki. You just, you just weren't thinking. That's not smart. And I went and got on the bus that we drove out on, and I looked in all the compartments and under the seats. And at that point, I would have drank a half a bottle <laughs> if I'd have found one. I was looking everywhere. I sat on that bus, and I'm, I'm shaking, and I've got the dry mouth, and my heart is beating really fast, and I'm sitting with my little side, side cooler in my lap, little small cooler, and I unzip it, and it's empty. And, and I said, Lord, I've really done a dumb thing here. I, 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 I've got to have some water. I, I'm in trouble. There's no water anywhere. And I'm sure other people don't have water to share at this point. It's towards the end of the day. But I, I got, I've got to have some water. And, and I just zipped that thing shut. And I laid my hands on it. And I said, in the name of Jesus, you've provided so many times. And this is not a want. This is a need. I, I've got to have some water in the name of Jesus. And all of a sudden, I felt, I just felt led to unzip that cooler. And there laid in that cooler, not just a bottle of water, but a cold bottle of water. I've spent my whole lifetime avoiding telling that story. But now I don't, I don't really care what people think, and I don't care about the naysayers that say that's impossible and the people that have never had anything like that happen. What I want to share with you is that there is nothing too big for him. And on that day, he provided a bottle of water and a cold bottle of water because I was in need. Don't think you shouldn't ask. Ask and he'll do it because that's the kind of God he is. And why wouldn't I believe him for anything when I can go back and remember? I can remember what he did in Africa on a hot day sitting on the bus. He provided a bottle of water. Hallelujah. The second thing David said to do he said that quarrel with your soul. Remind yourself of what God's done in the past. And the second thing he said to do was praise. He went and got his harp. He didn't feel like praising. You ever, you know, you're just going through it. You don't feel like praising. 
Let somebody else praise right now. I don't feel like, I don't have a praise in my heart. I, I don't feel like praising. That's the time that you bring a sacrifice of praise. It's not a sacrifice any other time when you're feeling good and everything's going great. It's fun to cut a rug for Jesus. But when you're laying in the valley of despair, you're grieving, you're broken, you're troubled on every side, there are people murmuring about you, you're hurting, you're wondering where in the world what's happened to your life, you have a secret that you can't tell anybody, you're living in an abusive situation, your children run away from home or you have a child in prison, you've lost a loved one, the doctor says there's no hope, on and on and on. Those are the times that you get up out of that chair, you get off the floor, you get out of the bed, you get dressed, you wash your face, you go find somebody laying on the side of the road to minister to, you get yourself to the house of God, you worship, you praise, you get in the front, you don't stay in the back, you make your way to the front and you praise him, you get out your harp and you praise him and you just praise him when you don't feel like it, you bring a sacrifice of praise, that will encourage you in the Lord and what happens in the middle of that praise break all of a sudden you begin to see the goodness and the glory of God and things begin to change God changes things when we praise and then praise goes from just pushing I got to just push this out because it's got to happen. I got to praise. I, got, I know I got to praise. And all of a sudden, praise turns into worship. And worship is a connection. And it comes from way down deep inside. And it's when the connection comes that you begin to get answers. And you begin to realize that God's got this all under control. I'm not alone. And it won't always be this way. Whatever you're going through, sister of mine, it won't always be this way. God's got a plan. You're going to recover it all. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Two things. Remember. And then praise. Remember what he's done. And then praise. I'm going to close with a little story. Something that happened to me. And I believe the Lord wanted me to tell you this little story. And if you want to come to the keyboard and play softly and give them some hope, that'd be nice. I was a little girl. I was about six years old. And I'm guessing that because my mother took a picture on that day. And I still have the picture. And it looked to, to be about six or seven. We didn't get a lot of gifts. My only experience with chocolate as a kid was a Hershey bar where we broke off the little squares and you might got two squares, maybe three, if you snuck one extra one. <laughs> but I loved chocolate. And on this very special day, a Valentine's Day, my dad came in the door hard worker, always worked two jobs when I was a kid so mom could stay home and so we didn't see him a lot a lot of times mom would let us stay up till 10 o'clock at night when he came in from the second job just to say goodnight I was the baby girl daddy came in and he had a bag in his hand he wasn't a real romantic sword he didn't say I love you a lot but I knew he loved me but out of that bag, he pulled chocolates. I remember him kind of just pitching a chocolate box at my mom. Happy Valentine's Day. My eyes just sparkled as I watched him pitch one to my two older sisters and then to me. Happy Valentine's Day. My first box of chocolates. I ran to my room. I was going to get in that room and shut the door before they took it away from me. I was going to eat as many as I could before they caught me. Because I love chocolate. 
So I opened my box and sat in the middle of my bed. It has that piece of paper, you know, that lays in there that smells so good. I pulled out a chocolate. I'm going to eat that one and that one and that one and that one. And I'm going to hurry because I knew they would come and take it away or they'd make me share or something. And so I grabbed this first one and popped it in my mouth. I'm sitting in the middle of my bed and I close my eyes just waiting that creamy goodness. And all of a sudden I realize something terribly wrong. Somebody has put orange bumpy stuff inside of a perfectly good chocolate. I, I, I'm so disappointed and it's so yucky and I'm chewing and chewing and it's just, it's nasty and I, I don't like it. And I'm all alone, you know, kids today would say, well, why didn't you spit it out? Because we weren't allowed to spit out stuff. Or starving children in Ethiopia. We had to eat every, everything, even if nobody was watching. We knew the all-seeing eye would see us. So I'm sitting in the middle of my bed and the tears are rolling. And I'm chewing and chewing this orange bumpy stuff and I'm so disappointed. It's just awful. And there's a knock on the door. Because daddy's coming to see and enjoy his little girl opening her first chocolates. They just realized I disappeared. He knocked and then he turned the knob and when he walked in, he had this big, beautiful smile on his face. And immediately it went, because he finds me sobbing. Chocolate running out of the corner of my mouth, the tears running down my face and sobbing. What in the world? What, what's the matter? He sits down on my bed and gathers me up in his arms he takes out his handkerchief and he wipes my tears and blows my nose now calm down tell me all about it daddy I I don't like it I just don't like it I don't like orange bumpy stuff inside of chocolate I, I'm so disappointed because I love them and I love chocolate, but I don't like those. And I'm crying and crying and I look up at my dad and I saw a look that I recognize now as an adult. That look he gave me was a look that said, I know something you don't know. He was smiling. It kind of made me mad because he's smiling like everything's okay and it's not okay. But that look said, I know something you don't know. I thought that every chocolate in that box was the same. It all had orange bumpy stuff in it. And if we're not careful in the midst of our trial, in the midst of this year of 2020, COVID, in the midst of the political mess and this, the arena that we see all around us in this wicked world, if we're not careful, we will only see that and it will look orange and bumpy and nasty and we'll work ourselves up into a dramatic place in life and forget about the mission. Daddy said, oh, baby, you're so wrong. That's only one. That's just one. You, you don't like it, but there's a whole box full of others in there you're going to love. There's peanut butter. There's toffee. There's caramel. There's a whole bunch of those things in there you're going to love. Really? I don't, I don't want to miss what Jesus is doing right now in this end time because I'm focused on the orange bumpy stuff all around us. Get
get your mind out of the newspaper and off the television and off the Netflix and off the things of this world and get your mind on the mission. Get up from where you're weeping and where you're crying. Get up and realize that this is just a small piece in the whole puzzle. He's getting ready to do a big work. We are a part of an end time, exciting time that the church is going to see unfold right before the sky split open. And we're going to see Jesus. And those who have gone on before us, whether it be from COVID or in a car accident or cancer or old age, they're all going to be there shouting around the throne. And it's not going to be very long. So why would I focus on orange bumpy stuff? But daddy, well, well, what do I, what do I do? He said, well, baby, I'll tell you what to do. You get ready to eat a little chocolate. You, you take it out and you take your little bitty finger and you poke it in the bottom. Oh, you're laughing because you do that. <laughs> you just make a hole right there in the bottom and then you look inside. And if it's one that you like, then you go right ahead and enjoy it. But if you don't like it, throw it away, right? No, baby, just put it back. Oh. Okay, Dad. So if I don't like what it looks like inside, I just put it back. That's right. Now, Dad, I'm going to keep my chocolates in my room, okay? I'm going to keep it in my secret place under my other pillow on my bed because I only sleep on one pillow. And I have my rock collection and my peacock feather <laughs> under my other pillow. And I'm going to put my candy there, okay, in my secret place. That would be great, baby. Do you have a secret place? A place that only you and your heavenly daddy know about? It's so important. A place where you get alone with him. Where you tell him about all the orange bumpy stuff. Where you simply put it back. You, you lay it at his feet. Lord, I don't, I don't like this and I don't understand it. And I'm still hurting from it. But, Lord, I'm giving it back to you. Use it for your glory. My beautiful friend said to me today, I'm so sorry, Vicki, you've had to suffer so much in your lifetime. I said, don't be sorry. I'm not sorry because in the brokenness is how I'm able to help other people. Out of brokenness comes beauty. And so I'm not sorry. Don't be sorry for your suffering. But don't lay and waller in it and let the devil use it. Because you could be on mind-altering drugs. You could be seeing a psychiatrist, and I'm not against counseling. But please understand you're paying somebody to listen to you. I've done it. I'm not judging. I've done it. But what I found is the secret place <laughs> where it's just me and my daddy. He's the wonderful counselor. And when I find that place alone with him and I take all that orange bumpy stuff and I lay it at his feet, I just put it back. I come out of there refreshed, knowing he knew it all the while and was holding me while I was hurting. The days went by and I kept getting into my chocolates until they were all gone. All except the ones that had orange bumpy stuff. Or any kind of bumpy stuff. I just kept putting those back. And finally one day after school I ran in and pulled that little box out from under my pillow. And it was... 
empty. Because my dad could take care of anything. Somewhere along life's road, he had come in, checked my little box. With his big, strong hand, he removed those ones. Actually consumed those ones I didn't like. I've lived 59 years now. And I can tell you, he's come in so many times and taken the orange puppy and removed it. And all of a sudden I woke up and it was gone. And he gave me back a hundredfold what the enemy tried to steal. You've heard the story of in years past of my daughter who ran away. That was 15 years ago. Now she's married and she's the youth pastor of our Spanish work in Madison, Wisconsin. She has some 20 youth that look to her and her testimony that are learning to walk with God. And I watch her with the tears rolling down her cheeks and the burden for their souls and their brokenness and their broken homes and, and all of that. And God took that orange bumpy stuff and turned it around. So why wouldn't we look back today and remember what he's done and apply it to what we're going through? Why wouldn't we praise why wouldn't we worship? Because he's going to do it again. I'm here to give somebody hope. Somebody sitting at home crying on the couch. Somebody laying in the bed that can't even hardly set up. They're, they're so sick and so worried and so tired of life. Put it back. And let Jesus take care of it. Wherever you are right now, would you lift your hands? Would you stand to your feet? Forget that you're watching or listening and, and just step into the presence of the Lord right now. He's there. He's with you in such a real way. He's going to heal your brokenness. He's going to heal your heart. Begin to praise Him. When you can't think of anything else, begin to praise Him for who He is. Thank you for breath that I breathe. Thank you for a heart that beats. Thank you, Lord, for feet that walk. Thank you that I'm not in the hospital. Thank you, Lord. Come on, begin to worship Him and praise Him today. He's going to meet you right where you are.
this together right now. Just lift your heart and your hands to the Lord. He has truly ministered to our spirits tonight. There are some of you that you thought you were alone where you are. And the voice of the Lord has swept into the room where you are. And he has reminded you that he knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly what you're walking through. He knows exactly what you're dealing with. And not for one moment has he left you. Not for one second have you been by yourself. So I just wonder if one last time you could thank him for that reminder right now that you could thank him for the peace that you are feeling that you haven't felt in a long time. Jesus, we are grateful. We are grateful for your word. God, we are grateful for the timeliness of this message, Jesus. God, that you have ministered to our hearts, that you have touched us right where we are, Lord, and we are thankful. We are so thankful for your goodness. The Lord is good, amen. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for being part of this. We invite you to share this. This is not just for this moment. God will use this to continue to minister to people. Thank you for being part of this tonight. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow. God bless you.